Oh, hello. Welcome to a brand new week. Brand new set of chores. <laughs> um, if you were with me last week, you'll remember that I was doing a, a whole shed load of shopping in preparation for um, some of my autumn and winter garden prep. And I'm down in my potting shed and this is the uh, sum of what that achieved. <laughs> so basically what I do this time of year um, is a whole load of fertilising and mulching to allow it to slowly decompose over winter to improve the soil, most particularly in the formal garden that surrounds the house. Although I do do some fertilising of my native plants, um, only the ones that I've planted, not every single plant on the property. Um, anyway, and so uh, what I have here is a great big sack of dynamic lifter, um, which is basically an organic fertiliser. Um, basically blood, fish and bone and other bits and bulbs. doesn't smell very nice, <laughs> but I mostly use that for my lawn. As I've mentioned, one of my bushfire strategies is a healthy lawn that doesn't require a lot of water. And uh, improving the soil beneath is one of my tactics for achieving that. Um, I've also got a big tub of fertiliser, slow-release fertiliser for my acid-loving plants and on my shelves there I already had fertiliser for some of my other plants. So I'll slow-release fertilise all my different types of plants and then I'll go round um, and make dung day nuts, that's why I've got these bags of sheep manure. Um, and then I'll give it a good water. I do also like to do this type of work when I know that it's going to be wet weather so I don't have to overly water <clears throat> and it probably will rain later so I'll rely on that. And then this is some topsoil that I got. Um, this is in preparation maybe a, a few vlogs ago, two or three vlogs ago now. I mentioned about rotivating up um, near the library a section of lawn that was very uneven and so this is some of the garden soil that I've got to help level it out once I've done that. The grass seed is back in the house. Uh, I wouldn't leave it out here because it would have just gotten eaten by mice by now. <laughs> and uh, the final component to this is my homemade compost. These are my compost bins in a section of the garden I call the compostery. As you can see, I've got five. And my system is, I started here and added successive compost bins. And I worked my way down. And essentially, the bins with the crosses on the lids are bins that are not to have new compost added to. And the bin with a tick is the bin that we can add compost to. So this is the bin with the newest compost and this is the bin currently with the oldest compost. And then as I say I work my way down and then back to the start. These three get um, bracken added to them. So the A stands for acid. These are basically my ericaceous composts. N for neutral, so these don't have bracken. So uh, this is what my compost looks like. Lovely friable material. All sorts of goes in there. It's mostly free scraps. Um, and as I say, this has the addition of bracken and it also has the ash from the fire. So no cooked food goes in there and actually no garden waste because I tend to burn that. Um, and so um, this is what I end up with. So what I'm going to do now is take my trusty shovel and transfer it from the compost bin to my wheelbarrow and then up the hill to my plants. <laughs> Just to show you what I'm using, um, so I'm going to go around and I've got um, my a rose gardenia and azalea compost for my acid loving plants and also I've got a rambling rector 
growing up this tree here. It's the only rose I'll allow on the property for the time being. I love roses, but I'm not sure they suit Australia. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so I've got that for my acid-loving plants and my rose. This is a slow-release fertiliser for my citrus. Citrus are very fertiliser-heavy. I've got an all-purpose, which I'll chuck round all my other plants, and then I've got one specially formulated for native plants. They have particular requirements, which means that you can't really use an all-purpose. And essentially, I'll just be using that on my Grevillea garden. So, I'm going to go make a start on that now. I'm just putting um, slow-release fertiliser up at the Grevillea garden. And whilst I was here, I noticed that um, if you can see the uh, woolly, bear, woolly bear hero is uh, thinking about flowering. That's definitely some thinking about flowering going on there and there and there. And closer up to me, there and down there. That'll be lovely. I'm not sure when it's going to flower, but uh, it's definitely thinking about it. <laughs> That's stage two complete. So I've used up all of my citrus slow release fertilizer and my general purpose fertilizer. And I used about half of my rose gardenia and azalea. That's one and a half kilo tub. And I used very little of the native because I don't have too many of these. So stage one, put down my homemade compost Stage two, the slow release fertilizer, and I'm going to have a cup of tea. And then stage three, dung donut time. Okay, we're about to start phase three. So I've got some of my manure tea bags worth in my wheelbarrow, and I'm up at my potted gardenias. Because they're in pots, these need a little bit of extra TLC, so as well as the homemade compost and the slow release fertilizer also add a layer of specialist rose azalea and gardenia compost and then top it off with a little bit of manure. And then there was one. Dung donuts and the spreading of the manure on other parts of the garden have all been done. So the last thing that remains for phase one of Operation Autumn is spreading the dynamic lifter on the lawns. Except I'm not going to do that today because uh, we're expecting some friends to come and visit in a couple of days time. And that stuff smells quite pungent. And it's the kind of smell that lingers. So my intention is to wait until they've been and gone so they don't have to suffer that smell for the next few days <laughs> and so now I'm going to turn my attention to my second job of today which is uh, planting out some new plants I've got so let's go and have a look at that. These are some plants that I got in the post last week and I'm now in a position to be able to plant them out um, so I've got this it's supposed to be a red bark dogwood but it looks suspiciously green to me um, it's called Sunshine, and it, it looks red in the picture. Um, this is going to be my latest addition to my autumn colour hedge, or border, uh, which is essentially the border where I planted the Chinese pistachio, if you remember that. And then I've got these two little blueberry plants. Um, sunshine blue and these are going in my edible hedge and this is what I call my edible head so on the other side of the fence you'll notice probably um, these little rosemary bushes um, here 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 and here those are all clones actually which I took from cuttings from the already established rosemary which is behind that buddleia 
I figured that um, if the rosemary bush that was existing was doing well in these conditions then I'll just take clones and hopefully these will do likewise. So these will fill out and form the edible hedge and the evergreen hedge at the front of this fence line or behind it from where I'm stood. And then on this side of the fence these are currant bushes and these were already here. Um, there was a raised bed here made out of a, a metal water tank that had been sliced into maybe about thirds or a quarter and um, there were some currant bushes, red currant bushes growing in it along with lots of other stuff and weeds and it was very untidy and the edges were sharp and there were actually two of these raised beds, one here and one here and it didn't fit my aesthetic so we dismantled those raised beds and cut them up and recycled the metal and I moved the current bushes that I wanted to salvage and replanted them in this hedge formation. And I did that maybe late winter, very early spring, just gone. And they all survived and thrived actually and they all produced fruit. However, whilst I call it an edible hedge, I don't mean edible for humans, I mean edible for birds. Because there's no way we would ever get fruit off an unprotected bush like this. Anyway, so there are then these one, two, three, four, five-ish gaps and my intention was to um, extend the hedge out more this way by infilling these gaps with other edible plants and I'm thinking maybe of things like um, raspberries, maybe a different type of currant, maybe some sort of more exotic type of berry. So I think I'll plant this one out first and then we'll move over and turn our attention to the blueberries. Well I'm all set up with what I need for phase one and that is the plant more or less where I want it and a little bit of planting compost and my spade. So as with the tree I just want to double check It'll go up to two meters and it'll go up to one meter. So that's quite a big plant for comparison. Yeah, it's possibly kind of similar to this one. This lovely autumn color plant oh, when fully mature. So Probably I can move it a bit more this way. Do that now. I think it's in a good spot in terms of its relationship to the fence. If I try and kind of space them out, it's pretty good. So this plant doesn't actually have much by way of autumn colour, <laughs> but it is evergreen, so that's sort of why it's there. And also it was in a different part of the garden and I didn't know what plant it was and how big it was going to get. I think it's a type of mock orange, I'm not sure. And I know that they can get huge, so I thought to be on the safe side, I'd move it somewhere where it didn't really matter how big it got. Um, and it has beautiful flowers in the spring, as does this. Um, I think it's a plant called something like Chinese Wishes, don't quote me on that. It has tiny little bauble white flowers on it, kind of looks like it's covered in snow. Very pretty, actually, and also I took cuttings from that plant and I've got uh, another one of its kind growing here, which I grew from cuttings to fill out this bed, which is the bed in front of the house. So yeah, I think that's a good spot for my dogwood and I will now dig a hole and shove it in the ground. Okay, quick update. So this is um, blueberry number one and up here I've planted blueberry number two which leaves me three spaces for other plants. Possibly I could put one there 
and possibly one there, but probably not. You'll notice that I've put the blueberries in cages, just from twigs I found up in the Grevillea garden. And that's because they're very, very wee plants and kind of soft and they look kind of delicious. <laughs> And this is the dogwood, which you can see is not in a cage. Um, and I use my judgment when it comes to whether I put plants in cages or not. If I spin round, you'll notice that um, I've got a, well, you'll possibly notice, let me try and zoom in. I've got a little citrus tree there, which isn't. And the one next to it, the lime, was never in a cage, uh, even though they're quite small. And that's because I've observed that Wallabies might take a leaf or two, but they're not inclined to sit and munch and munch and munch a citrus plant as they might the Chinese pistachio. The reason that I have chosen not to put this in a cage is that uh, I know this to be a deciduous plant and I can tell by looking at the leaves that it's getting ready to drop them and a wallaby is most likely to only munch the leaves so I think it could stand to lose them and possibly not getting quite a good sense of scale, but this is actually a relatively tall plant. This may be sort of 40 centimeters tall, maybe slightly more, and it's very, very woody. So I'm pretty confident that the only part of this plant that's liable to get munched is the leaves. But anyway, if I remember rightly, I think um, pruning dogwoods is actually pretty good for them so I'm I'm happy to leave this one as is and if I step back my latest addition to my autumn interest border slash hedge <laughs> I packed so much into day one of operation let's get ready for autumn that I think that this might be the last uh, day of content that I can add to this vlog um, this is a spillover so um, Today I'll probably be putting down a dynamic lifter. I waited till our guests have left and also um, this afternoon it's very likely to rain so it seems like a good opportunity to get it down and get it started breaking down in the, in the water from the rain. I've also got a suspicion that this could be the last time until spring that I mow the house lawns. <laughs> So I could actually have finally reached the last. So this footage you're about to see could be the last time you see this type of footage for four or five months. I finished the lawns. Let me just show you. So they've been made, they've been strimmed, they've been dynamically lifted. And I think, as I mentioned, that could be that for this season. Wait till very, very late winter now before I may have to lawn mow the lawns again. Anyway, so I thought I'd just round off this film this week with a Another glimpse of my red oak because it's way more in its autumn colours than when we first looked. And I think it's looking beautiful and I wanted to share it with you. And also I remembered that um, I was going to give you an update on my new work leggings. You may remember last week I introduced you to my Raab thermal fleece lined leggings. And I did wear them um, that one day where I tried them on for you. And it was a pretty chilly day and I can confirm they were amazing. <laughs> Could almost be, perhaps, probably, the best gardening clothing I've ever bought. 
so um, if you are looking for something practical and comfortable to wear in the garden or walking in winter or autumn I can highly recommend those Rav leggings and I can also highly recommend this beautiful tree have a good weekend and I look forward to your company next week bye